forward. So I don't forget to do that because you don't want to forget to do that. Don't worry. All right. And so I see people, um, our participants are starting to flow in. So this is great. We're going to give it just the, an extra minute or so while we reach a critical capacity. Um, and in the more, in, in the meanwhile, I will just ask these two Texans how they're doing today. And how are you doing? I'm doing great. Awesome. I'm doing great. Very relaxed. Yeah. That's how we And I see, I see a bunch of my longtime friends logging in. That's awesome. It. Yeah. Good. I hope the longtime friends will pepper the chat with. Yeah. Yeah. Cindy. I haven't no talked to Cindy you. in a very long time. She's another uh, fellow Texan. Nice. And we got Francesco. And Francesco, of course. Of course. on the line. Buongiorno, Francesco. <laughs> Great. Morning, Julie. Everybody is coming on in. And Stephen, yeah, Stephen Pace, another fellow Texan. We got a lot of Texans. Well, Stephen and I actually, Stephen and Cindy and I actually all know each other from Denver originally. Okay. And all ended up in Texas. What's your Denver connection, Ken? I lived in Denver for 27 years. Wow. I went to the University of Denver for college. I came from upstate New York and I never went back. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I lived there. That my whole early career was all up in Colorado before I moved here to Texas. Nice. So Rocky yeah. Mountain Oracle user group, Rocky Mountain Dama chapter, um, you know, working with, uh, with Julie and uh, lots of lots of people up there in uh in Colorado. Yeah, I, moved, I didn't move to Texas till 2006. Okay. I moved to Denver in 1979. Wow. All right. That's a pretty common theme. People that move to Denver don't really want to ever leave. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> well, that's where I am now. And it's, uh, I know we've got a lot of people uh, from Denver on the line as well. And we just love it. It's a little chillier today. So I can't, I can't I'm not going to lie, Ken. I'm noticing your green lawn behind you. I'm looking at it a little bit lovingly, but we're on our way because, you know, we had an 80 degree day. Uh, like wow. Two ago. I know. And then it, of course, was rainy in like 30, but you know, whatever. We had an 80 degree day. It warmed us up. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we've got a, we've got a good amount of people coming in. I'm watching these numbers grow. But in the meanwhile, let's get everything kicked off. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Welcome to today's session. My name is Kaylee Garrido. I head up marketing and events here at Great Data Minds. A um, little bit about GDM. We are sort of a two-part harmony. Um, we have services around strategic planning, education, and the deployment of critical data projects. We do that on our Great Data Minds Innovation Lab side of the house. And then over here on GDM, um, we have uh, the content creation side and we love to host a ton of great events. Um, just like what we're doing today with transformational thought leaders, just like Kent Graziano. So thank you so much for joining us, Mr. The Data Warrior. <laughs> Mr. V, I like that. That's All right. right, so a little bit of housekeeping before we get into everything. Um, everybody knows how to use Zoom uh, after these last two years of fully virtual life. Um, but of course, this is a webinar, so the cameras and mics are off, but I already see everybody's in the chat. So this is where we like to encourage people to have conversation, chat amongst yourselves, enter your questions if you want to. We love when people put that into the chat, because we often see that other attendees will be able to chime in on the discussion. Um, so go ahead and keep on using that, uh, that chat. Now, for today's special guest, our thought leader today is the data warrior, Kent Graziano. Uh, Kent is an internationally recognized industry expert uh, in cloud and agile data warehousing. He has written dozens of articles and given hundreds of presentations, both nationally and internationally. He's co-authored multiple books that are related to data model, including the Data Model Resource Book, which was co-written with Bill Inman, a good friend of Great Data Minds, and Len Silverson, um, and the Business of Data Vault Modeling, with uh, co-authored with Dan Lindstedt. And in addition, he is the author of four Kindle format data warehouse and data modeling related books, all available on amazon.com. If that wasn't enough, if it wasn't enough, now we get to go into the fun stuff, which is that he's working on compiling a foodie book, a uh, foodie photo book, which is um, comprised of the photos that he's taken during his recent years of travel around the US and the globe while working for Snowflake. And then 
Beyond all that, he's also been practicing and teaching traditional Taekwondo for over 40 years, which is actually longer, Kent, than you've been doing your database and uh, data modeling. Yes, it has. What, what don't you do? What can't you do? <laughs> Come on. Well, we, right. we know he does furniture. Right? <laughs> furniture? Uh -huh. Oh, right. Oh, when your wife orders furniture for your... For yeah, your I, get, I get to do the assembly. I got very uh -huh. good at that over the last couple of years. That's it. Getting to put together bed bed frames and uh, oh. and, and mattresses and yep. all kinds. They got these new ones now that you can actually get them there. They come compressed, an actual mattress that comes rolled up, compressed. I just got one of those. Yeah. They're like vacuum packed, and they're a queen size one is really heavy, as it turns out. Ooh, and then yeah. getting you know wrangling that into the bedroom and then cutting yep. the plastic open and watch it go. Psh, <laughs> that's so that's like a satisfying video i love that stuff yeah um okay and of course we have mike lampa who's our very own chief analytics officer here at great data minds mike is a true transformation agent who works with enterprises to modernize their analytics programs from the ground up he's got experience on both sides of the decks um he was an executive analytics practitioner and um you know now he is uh helping all of our clients get all their big favorite big projects done. Um, in addition to that stuff, because we got to share so much good personal stuff about Kent, I also would like to say that I have firsthand experience that he's a stellar cook, soulful guitar player, and a proud papa to two young grandsons. Actually, a granddaughter now too. Yeah, two grandsons and a granddaughter. Another yeah, one due is, in like two weeks. So. This is amazing. The legacy is growing. Okay, so enough of my uh, jabber and Mike and Kent, I will turn the floor to you. Thank you, Kalia. Kent, thank you for joining us, my friend. Sure, good to see you, Mike. Good to see you too. All right, so the life and times of the data warrior. Give us, give us a little background and give, give us a sense for the journey you've been on. As you well, know. yeah, it, it's, it's been a 40 plus year journey. Um, I actually learned to program my senior year in high school uh -huh. with, along with my math teacher. The, did that during study halls and uh, that led to all kinds of things in in college working as a lab assistant and then getting to take over programming for the the uh, graduate students in that and then eventually going to work in and this was at university of denver as i mentioned earlier this is where i went and i got a degree in environmental science um, but then ended up with a lot of jobs helping people with computers and ended up working for the u.s geological survey there in denver at the federal center uh, drawing maps because my degree was environmental. And when I drew all the maps that they needed me to drew in the part-time job I had, I finally asked them, it's like, hey, do you, do you have any, I see you got one computer guy. Does he maybe need some help? And sure enough, he did. And he taught me uh, Fortran. I already mm. knew basic. We did some early GIS work. And then out there at the Denver Federal Center, I eventually got introduced to Oracle Technologies. Version five of Oracle in 1989, I think it was. Mm -hmm. and, and that led me to joining uh, the Rocky Mountain Oracle user group and eventually being on their board of directors, um, helping organize the, the first Rocky Mountain Oracle user group training days, which at the time it was the Rocky Mountain Oracle user group training day. Mm -hmm. uh, the first couple of years, it was just one day. So I uh, got, got involved in that, worked at the federal center at various agencies for about 10 years, then joined a small startup called Apogee Open Systems that eventually mm. became Oracle Energy. And that's where I met uh, uh, Rick Williams, who was president of our mug at the time, recruited me to come work there and learn Oracle Case. And so I learned the Oracle Case technologies, and he's the one who taught us to be evangelists. Mm, okay. He's the one that said, we're going to go out and we're going to show people how to use this tool because it's a great idea, but there's so much power in it. It's really hard to get your head wrapped around it. And so he required as part of our job, we had to write and submit abstracts and papers to the user groups, um, Armug, IOUG, and at the time, the case SIG, the case special interest group. And that was part of our job. So we had to find something that we were working on for, this, for the company and figure out how to write it up and, and what can we teach people about the tool and how to use it. And that led to the, uh, the long list of presentations um, that I did from there on. Mm -hmm. is just got in, involved because he encouraged us to go beyond the local region to go apply to the international groups. Um, 
I remember the very first IOUW, International Oracle User Week, before there was ever an Oracle Open World that I, I went to, uh, I think it was in Pasadena, California. And up on the big screen, here's my, my friend Rick talking about the importance of the user groups. Because back then in 1989, the Rocky Mountain Oracle User Group was, and I think still is, the largest, most active Oracle user group in the country. And so as president of that group, he got to give a testimonial on video for, uh, for the big international conference, which was maybe 3,000 people at the time. And that really did kind of inspire me to go, like, wow, this is, you know, here's somebody from Denver at an international conference, you know, somebody I know because he runs the group that I'm involved in. And so I eventually went to work for him and uh, he, was, he was our mentor on how to be uh, technology evangelists, really. For, uh, for lack of any, the term, he actually used the term evangelist. Nobody else used that term back then, uh, but he used the term evangelist and we went out and, and did all those things. And that just led to years and years of, of doing this at various organizations, uh, Denver Public Schools. Uh, I got to do five years there. And that's where I met, when I met uh, Julie and Dan Lindstedt and a, and a bunch of others getting into the data vault world. Uh, and that's where I got uh, achieved the Oracle Ace status. I was one of the first Oracle Aces in about 2006, um, and went on for there to actually being an Oracle Ace director and involved at that level in the Oracle community. Yes, Jeff, I won't forget Odie Tug. The Oracle Case thing <laughs> did become Odie Tug. <laughs> yeah, I was on the board for that for for many years. So I was on conference committees for IOUW until OC till OOW came about uh, 15 years on the RMUG board, about that same number of years on the, uh, the OD tug board, the OC SIG and then OD tug board mm -hmm. and just on and on. And then, um, then 2015 rolled around and I, I got introduced to Snowflake. Yeah. So th that journey with Oracle, that had to be awfully rewarding, but incredibly, I mean, it sounds like you were incredibly busy. Yeah, my, my family still reminds me of that, that even when I was working full time for a non consulting company like Denver Public Schools, mm -hmm. I was traveling out of town, almost probably once every six weeks, because I was very active on the OD tug board at the time, I think I might have been president then. Um, and I got to be a liaison to other groups. And so I was speaking at conferences all over the place for, for many, many years, like I said, even when I wasn't uh, actually uh, working for a consulting firm. You figure when you work for a consulting firm, you're going to be traveling all over the place. Right. And I did that with Aris Corporation. We had an entire team of Oracle designer experts and we went to the OD Tug conference, went to IOEW, went to RMUG. So we were all over the place talking about how to use the Oracle designer product. Uh, but then I left and ended up going to work for Denver Public Schools, figuring, okay, it'll be a little calmer. Still mm -hmm. ended up traveling about once every six weeks, even, yeah. even then. They wouldn't let you go, would they? <laughs> no, no, no. As, as I said in one of my posts about my retirement, just when I got out, they dragged me back in. Uh, and you, you guys are, Julie is part of that, right? <laughs> yeah. She's pretty good at dragging people back in, that's for sure. So more rewarding um, helping the communities than it was um, doing solution design, solution delivery for you? Uh, it, it's a balance. It's uh -huh. a balance. I, I I really do like delivering the solutions, right? And solving people's problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but along the line, I actually come from a family of educators. Both of my brothers are teachers. My grandmother was a teacher. My mm -hmm. uncle was a teacher. And as you mentioned, I'm actually a martial arts. I'm a Taekwondo instructor myself. Right. And so when Rick taught us about going and speaking at conferences, all my talks tended to be tutorial like, here's how to do this. I did step by step. I violated all the PowerPoint rules. Everything ah. I said was in the PowerPoint. So when people got back to their office, they could follow step by step, click by click, how to do what I had just done and what I told them about in the, oh, nice. uh, in, in the talk. And so, yeah, that was in incredibly rewarding, right? To, to know that mm -hmm. not only do I have, you know, whether I was working for a company or working for somebody like Denver Public Schools, or I was a consultant working with, you know, a dozen different, uh, organizations, helping them solve whatever problem they were. Speaking at the conferences allowed me to help people like me solve the problems they were having, which was, 
how do I make this stuff work? They're trying right. to do the same thing. They're trying to deliver a solution for their employer or their, their customer. And mm -hmm. if they were having problems with it, you know, if I could help, I did. Yeah. My, uh, my Taekwondo master at one point said, you don't have to be a black belt to teach a white belt. Even a mm -hmm. green belt knows more than a white belt. And that's where I got the inspiration to not, um, we talk about imposter syndrome. People are afraid to go speak because, well, who am I? What do I know, mm -hmm. right? I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I know diddly compared to X, Y, and Z. The yeah, somebody's going to stump me out Stump, there, right? <laughs> right. Somebody's going to come out there. And, you know, of course, there's a little bit of fear that somebody's going to play stump the chump with you, which uh, I find very entertaining now because I, I, I generally win those um, mm -hmm. these days. But to be able to go and know that people who are coming to your sessions are coming because they have questions and your experience may very well be the one thing that they need to go back to their employer and actually become successful themselves to not only meet the goals and objectives of their employer, but to grow themselves and build confidence in themselves that they can, they can get that satisfaction from delivering a solution. Well, and I can, I can see the embodiment of fulfillment here um, that you had during that journey. Um, so tell me, what was the tipping point for going over to Snowflake? Um, actually, I was working on an agile project remote with some friends in Denver, and we decided to do a face-to-face -face meeting because we hadn't seen each other in months. Um, so we came up to do a little agile scrum workshop. And that week I had gotten an invitation from Tim Gorman, who at the time was president of the Rocky Mountain Oracle user group. He sent me an invitation for a big day to meet up that happened to be one of the nights I was in Denver and happened to be at my alma mater. It was at DU at the University of Denver in one of the buildings that I hadn't been in in probably 20 years. And, and the title was, come, you know, come see this. We're gonna talk to Snowflake, the data warehouse built for the cloud. Mm -hmm. And being somewhat of a skeptic over the years of working with Oracle, I was mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, what, what, what kind of crap is this? The data right. warehouse built for the cloud and it's called Snowflake on top of it. And this was before Snowflake had a negative term for sure. Um, so I went and uh, Kyle Rourke and Todd Beauchene, uh, Kyle was the VP for sales for the West and Todd was one of the lead uh, um, sales engineers for Snowflake did their presentation. There was like 12 of us. And one of the people in the room was uh, Rob who lives in Denver as well. And he was a newly minted sales engineer that Snowflake had just hired in Denver. And so there was like 12 of us, to Oracle, a couple of Oracle DBAs, myself, and I was like going, okay, we'll see what these guys got. And I, I'm prepared to destroy them, right? <laughs> I'm very, it's like, I've been at this for quite a while already. I, I, they're just, I'm, I'm ready there to call BS. And they did the demo and they did a live demo of loading this data and automatic, you know, provisioning on the fly, these virtual warehouses, the virtual compute clusters mm -hmm. and without any setup. And I was at the time working on a SQL server project where we had waited six weeks just to get access to a server mm -hmm. in order to start to build a data warehouse on a three month project. And when they said, well, at that time, it's like you send an email um, off their website and in 24 hours, you're gonna have a system. I was like, 24 hours? And you don't have to know how big it is because the storage is dynamic. You don't need to know how many users you're gonna have because the compute is dynamic. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, we can do big data too. And then they proceeded to demonstrate um, analyzing JSON documents using SQL. And so all of that combined, this is like an hour and a half, right? At most. During that session, I started tweeting at Claudia saying, mm -hmm. we got to get these guys in front of BBBT. This is freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and it really was just, just totally blew me away. What was the capabilities? Uh, Cause I hadn't really thought about the cloud. I'd been trying to avoid big data cause I didn't want to learn MapReduce or Hadoop right. or anything, but then it's like, okay, I can do this with SQL in a database. Okay, I'm in. So mm -hmm. I just started following the company and following their tweets and saw a tweet for an opening said, we're hiring. And so mm -hmm. I actually had Todd's card. So I called him and said, Hey, I just saw this thing. 
He spent an hour on the phone with me, telling me about the company, walking me through the website, telling me about the history of the founders. And when I found out the founders had come from Oracle and helped design Oracle's optimization engine, I'm going, oh, so this isn't a couple of 20 year olds who just came up with some idea at Stanford. These guys have been doing it for 20 years and have 100, over hundred patents between them at the time. It's like, these guys know what they're doing. And then, oh, by the way, we got Bob Muglia the former president of the server division at Microsoft as the CEO. So it's like, we got Microsoft and Oracle people working together. What? <laughs> what? Exactly. It's like, uh, it's like, this is like world peace here. Mm -hmm. It's like, so I got to look into it. So I ended up looking into it and um, had a really nice interview with uh, my, the guy who ended up my manager, John Bach, who was a VP of product and marketing at the time. Um, did a bunch of uh, phone interviews. They flew me out. I got to meet face to face with the founders. I was like, I've never been interviewed by a founder in my life. So I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. this is impressive. And then almost everybody I interviewed with was my age or older. So I was able to come back and, and talk to my wife and say, hey, this is not a bunch of youngsters who don't know what they're doing. These mm -hmm. are people who have run successful businesses before, who have been in the business as long as I have. Mm -hmm. This thing's real. Um, so uh, I, actually flew back from the, this is the fun part. I flew back from San Mateo to Den, no, to Denver. I was living in Houston already by then. Uh -huh. And then the next day got on a plane and flew up to Colorado to go to a BBBT session in Boulder at Claudia's office because the presenters was Snowflake. And it hmm. was the CEO of Snowflake and the guy who was gonna eventually be my boss. And so I got to sit as an analyst in their presentation, their first presentation to BBBT and hear, hear the story right. direct from the CEO, mm -hmm. um, who, as it turned out, didn't know I had interviewed for a job. So he, he, he treated me like I was one of these inter international analysts that's part of BBT. Mm -hmm. So got to have lunch with him. There's like five of us, went to a little pub in Boulder afterwards, had to sit down and have lunch and have a nice casual conversation with him. And then, uh, you know, get, get back to uh, uh, Houston and told my wife, well, if they offer me a job, I'm definitely taking it. Mm hmm. Okay, so no dual citizenship there. Huh? No, no, no dual citizenship there. In fact, when they John actually came over, I was in San Francisco I was at Oracle headquarters at an Oracle ACE director meeting. When I got mm -hmm. a call for, uh, hey, we got one more person that we want that wants to interview Chris Degnan, who's the chief revenue officer now, he had been out of town. So he interviewed me for about 30 minutes. And then an hour later, John calls and says, well, we want to make you an offer. Can I meet you tomorrow morning in person? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so he actually came to the Oracle campus and I stepped out of the Oracle ACE director meeting and, and he made me the offer wow. to, to start as soon as I could. Okay. And since I was an independent consultant at the time, I didn't even need two weeks to, to mm -hmm. say, yeah. I was like, wow. <laughs> so yeah, so it was, right. a, it, it was a great confluence of events. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks to uh, my network. I mean, really, if Tim had not invited me to that Armug big data meetup, who knows how long it would have been before I'd heard about Snowflake. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you had an incredibly successful recipe at uh, Oracle standing up the ACE and building community. Um, talk to me a little bit and tell the audience a little bit. Um, how'd you bring that recipe to Snowflake? Uh, well, it, what I ended up doing, honestly, I mean, I talked to him about it, knew we needed to build something eventually. Um, mm -hmm. I actually managed to steal one of the community organizers from Oracle to come work for me at Snowflake. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the beginning of our professional services and our education division that's there now. Um, mm -hmm. And eventually we got, you know, the, the, data, the data superheroes program got going actually under, under other people. I was, you know, kind of there on the side as the, hey, here, here's what I'm, here's what I've seen work before here. Here's how I think we should approach it. So I got to advise the people putting that community program together. Uh, but all along what I started doing as soon as I got to Snowflake is I actually did presentations about Snowflake at Oracle user groups because I had such a reputation in the Oracle world that people were still inviting me to speak. It's like, well, I can come and I can talk about the cloud. Um, and in many cases it was like, okay, just, don't specifically mention Snowflake. Okay. okay. So I took all the principles that were underlying Snowflake and all the reasons for doing something like Snowflake and all the capabilities mm -hmm. in the cloud and turned that into a presentation 
on what's the future architecture, what's the, the future of data in the cloud, um, mm -hmm. and actually did it as a keynote at Rocky Mountain Oracle user group one, one year at their training days. Um, so I just, I, I took it out into the Oracle community and I, uh -huh. then I started recruiting other Oracle aces and ace directors to come work at Snowflake with me. Oh, oh my God. You are the magnet, bring the people to you. Um, so what was the time frame around the, uh, this, this period? What, what period was I, it? I joined Snowflake in November of 2015 and uh, my employee number is 103. Oh, cool. <laughs> it, was only, it was only US based at the time. I was the first non sales remote employee. Mm -hmm. um, and it just grew from there. I mean, yeah. I, I traveled around the country giving talks. Uh, John gave me the opportunity. We had a thing we called the world tour at the time, which of course really wasn't a world tour. It was just in the US. And the first mm -hmm. one was actually up in Dallas. And uh, Claudia, I had helped connect everybody with Claudia. Claudia did the keynote, and then I did the Snowflake keynote and did a 30-minute uh, talk on my top 10 favorite features of Snowflake. And as a technical architect, that resonated with a lot of people. And that turned into dozens of talks that I gave along those lines and blog mm -hmm. posts and a series of blogs and really articulating for people, what's, what's the differentiator here? Why, why do I think Snowflake is so cool? Yeah. Um, without bashing Oracle or anybody else, because no, we, no. we didn't want to be bashing anybody. The fun part was though, is then other people who knew me in the Oracle community will look at that and say, like, well, man, we can't do that with Oracle. Mm -hmm. Maybe I better look at this thing. Um, yeah. And so, that, and so that's again, how I did it again, via network and uh, getting involved with partners as we expanded into Europe, found out, you know, I'd spoken in Europe a couple of times through the, the Oracle user group network. Mm -hmm. um, turned out I had a lot of fans there in Europe that became Snowflake partners uh, with the Data Vault because Data Vault was very popular in, in Northern Europe. So people knew me from my work with Dan and Data Vault. Um, and that really, uh, really kicked it off and, and got, got things growing. You mentioned community a couple of times. What, what is the value to the community around these kind of programs, these evangel evangelistic ACE programs? Yeah, I mean, now, now they, sometimes they call them community advocates now. Sometimes they're advocates or uh, community evangelists. Well, it, it'll, it creates, again, a network. For me, the network that I grew in my early career led to all of these things in my later career. Mm -hmm. Right is is I even though I knew I was not an Oracle DBA, and I didn't want to be an Oracle DBA, but I through the network and through these community programs, mm -hmm. I met the top Oracle DBAs in the world, and I could send them back in the day, would send them an email, say, "Hey, we're having this problem. Have you ever seen this before?" And usually within an hour, I got an answer faster mm -hmm. than I could ever get from Oracle support. Right. right? Um, and so the value of these community programs like the Snowflake Data Superheroes program is these are people who are really steeped in the technology and the use and functionality of the product, mm -hmm. and they want to help other people. So you get into the program by you know writing blog posts, participating in meetups and webinars and podcasts, mm -hmm. and speaking about your experience with the product and the problems you were able to solve, again, hopefully as a way of instructing other people, alleviating people's fears. I mean, there was a lot of fear around Snowflake early on because it was oh, in the gosh. cloud, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people mm -hmm. said, oh, we'll never go to the cloud. Exactly. Obviously we don't, and that, again, 2015, 2016, now we're in 2022, yeah. And he was, what do you mean you're not going to the cloud? That, exactly. That's not even a question now, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that's mm -hmm. what, seven years, right? In seven years time that's has been bad. such a massive shift in our industry compared to even the prior, the prior 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's been amazing. So, you know, the value is definitely twofold for the, for the people in the general community. It's the opportunity to learn and, and learn in a, uh, a very organic way from people who have been doing these things for the, the data superheroes for them. It's a, it's a chance to learn to teach. It's a chance to be a mentor. It's a chance to be a role model and set an example for others in the community. And, and honestly, it, Helps your career. Mm -hmm. Having, uh, I'm, I'm reasonably convinced at least part of the reason Snowflake hired me is because of the massive network I already had. 
you know, when I joined Snowflake, I had more Twitter followers than they did. Now they're way, way, way past me. So, but in the early stages of a company and a technology, that's what you need, right? How do you get the word out? I mean, that's why it's called evangelism, right? Yep. Is how do you get the word out? But then the community advocates and evangelists, their, their value is definitely in making sure people can be successful yeah, with the I product, right? Yeah, I love that pay it forward model, right? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we, know we are eventually going to retire. Maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but it, it'd be nice to know that you got a bunch of evangelists um, underneath you taking it forward. Right? Yeah. It. So I love that community model. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got what, one question here from uh, Z. It was on our list where you treated as a bit of an outcast at Oracle <laughs> as a result of that. Um, to a, a little bit, I, I had, the, I feel really bad for the gal who was running the Oracle ACE program because she had to actually call me. They made her call me and tell me I was no longer welcome to attend the ACE director briefing that was coming mm -hmm. up in a couple of days. I was actually in San Mateo at the Snowflake office, literally a couple of miles from the Oracle office. And they said, you know, uh, the powers that be have said, you can't come because you work for Snowflake. And this yeah. was early on. And to me, I was like, I was shocked. It's like, Snowflake's a little startup. Yeah, it was founded by a couple of guys from Oracle but it's just doing data, this little thing, data warehousing. Oracle does so much. Exactly. Um, and, yeah. and as an ACE director, I've signed an NDA. Mm -hmm. So I was, I'll say I was a little personally offended that they didn't think that I would stick to the NDA. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this had come up a couple of times before. Several other Oracle ACE directors had gone for companies that were marginally competitive with, with, uh, with Oracle. And mm -hmm. so the conversation had come up before, but I'm the first one that I know of that they said, yeah, no, you, you just can't come. Yeah, You can't come to the meeting. Sure. So I did, I did go have dinner with all the ACE directors though that night okay. and had, had some pizza with them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and in reality, I, under, I understood they were worried about non-disclosures and all of that. But in reality, what happens at those meetings is you're getting a pre-announcement of what Larry and the rest are going to say at Oracle Open World two days later. And so there's, it's really was to prep us to, if we wanted to write blog posts about it and have the blog posts ready to go so that when the announcement was made at open world, we just hit publish. Um, gotcha. So I think it was a little silly, uh, but um, you know, obviously there was a, a little, some hard feelings sure. uh, at Oracle for our founders and some of the people who left to join, join it. And little did we know that someday we would be the largest software IPO in history and yeah. have a valuation upwards of a hundred billion dollars. I yeah, mean, was, I, I, I knew it was stunned. a great product and I was, yeah. I was happy to help and boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I don't think our founders saw it coming. I mean, mm -hmm. as the company grew, I would always ask them is like, what do you think of this? It's like, wow. Uh, we didn't think it was going to go like this. This is, this is way beyond their dreams. I mean, they were good technologists who just wanted at, at classically is they build a better mousetrap, right? Mm -hmm. And they knew they could build a better one from scratch than what they were doing previously. Um, and they have, obviously. And yeah. it's, just, it's a, a massive success. Um, and they, that, uh, that none of us I, saw coming, really. And spawned a lot more. I mean, the, the, the creativity of the technology being spawned and um, um, revealed, you know, in all around the databases and now all the ancillary services. I'm just, I love our yeah. industry right now. <laughs> yeah. The, the one thing I want to say though, is the Oracle community itself. I was never an outcast from them right. because the Oracle community is independent, the Oracle user groups. So I was still welcomed at the, I still presented at numerous Oracle user groups, mm -hmm. even after I'd been uh, made a uh, ACE director alumni and couldn't go to those meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was still welcome at the user groups. Like I said, did a keynote at Rocky Mountain Oracle user group. Mm -hmm. um, did some videos with, with folks from, from the community, presented at OD Tug, uh, and a lot of conferences uh, for, for quite a few years. I stopped doing that probably about three or four years ago um, when, when it got to the point where it's like, okay, this stuff is no longer really relevant in that community, but the community mm -hmm. itself are still you know, a, lo a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. In that community, uh, the leaders of those communities are, are still, you know, we were always remained on, on good terms. Yeah, just, Oracle, Oracle Corporation, you know, they're, they're, 
you know, pr doing what they thought they needed to do to protect sure, sure. their IP. So I, we got a question here from John. Um, first of all, great to see you, Ken. Uh, what, so what is the path forward now for the data warrior? <laughs> well, I am, uh, as I, I keep trying to tell people, I'm semi-retired. Uh, so no longer uh, uh, on the road all the time. And that was a, a request from my family. Because uh, prior to COVID, I was traveling pretty near 100%. And it was all over the globe between Europe and Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and, and the United States and Canada that I, I was gone too much. Uh, so my, my family said, let's, you know, as we're coming out of COVID here, you know, could, could we not do that? And I said, sure, sure, we can do that. So um, I'm doing some advisory work for a number of Snowflake partners and uh, also working with um, Data Rebels and Data Vault Alliance on the Data Vault side and uh, working in, you know, proper use of how to use Snowflake in the Data Vault world and, and continuing work along those lines. Um, but very, very light, very light, not, you know, a couple hours a week here and there trying to keep it down so I can, uh, I can, I can enjoy the, the beach house here. My, my go. actual retirement job is I drive my son who's a senior in high school. Uh, so since January, I've been driving him to school and picking him up every afternoon uh, as he's nearing his, his graduation. So that's, that's my first job. That's my yeah. number one job. And number two is, uh, is the honey-do list from my wife, which includes helping, uh -huh. uh, helping set up furniture and, uh, and, and, and run things like that. And then number three is my advisory work. Um, that's somewhere in, in there, we order, talked about the right? book earlier. Yeah, I'm still working on uh, trying to work with uh, Cindy and Dan to update uh, one of the original Data Vault technical books to Data Vault mm -hmm. 2.0. And we're probably eh, maybe three quarters of the way through on that. And then the foodie book. Uh, a friend exactly. of mine, two years in a row, I got Christmas cards saying, you know, all those pictures that you post on Instagram and Facebook, you really should put those into a book. And so when I decided I was going to retire, I actually sat down and I, I made the outline for the book over a year ago. So now it's just a matter of compiling it all together. It's probably going to be a while. Um, turns out uh, retirement is, uh, is, is very busy. Is very, very busy. busy. Yeah. <laughs> I also volunteer at my uh, at church. We have a, a food pantry where mm -hmm. we, we distribute food to, uh, to poor folks, they come through three times a week to pick up a couple of bags of groceries and uh, meat and other essentials. Uh, we actually are the largest one here in, in Montgomery County. Um, and so I actually uh, spend, you know, half a day, two or three days a week at least there helping with that. So it turns out there, there's, lots, there's lots of opportunity to uh, what, stay buddy, busy. You are a beautiful soul. I mean, every aspect of your life, you're paying it forward and helping others. I love that. I love that. Hey, Ozzy said hi to you. And he, he's saying that uh, he can associate uh, with what you went through when you first saw Snowflake. Did your Oracle friends think, think of you as a bit of a pariah? No, actually, um, what... As I said, when I had the, the interview, I was actually at an Oracle Ace Directors meeting when I got the final job offer. And mm -hmm. we had the Ace Director meeting that night and I started telling people, hey, I, I just got an offer from this company, Snowflake. And a bunch of them went, Snowflake, really? Oh, you got to take it. And I was like, wait, what? You guys know what this is? And they're like, yeah, yeah. We know Ben Juan, Thierry. We've, we've known about it. We have friends that work there already. And it was a bunch of people in the Bay Area. And so, no, they didn't. They were like, congratulations, this is awesome. So that, that kind of sealed the deal as it were. I was already pretty much gonna take the job, but then when I started talking to other ACE directors and they knew what Snowflake was already and it was like, yeah, we agree 100%. This is, mm -hmm. this is, this is a good deal. If you can go get a job at Snowflake, definitely go do it. Good, yeah. So Francesco's got one for you. Tell us about SQL DBM. How'd you decide to join them? What's up with that? Oh, Anna, you got to love this. I see Anna's on there too. It's like, um, they're a cloud-based data modeling tool. And I have been a, uh, as anybody who's followed my career, massive advocate of data modeling from oh, day thank one. Thank you. Did yeah, everybody we, hear we, that out there? We have <laughs> to have data modeling. And 
we went through this thing with NoSQL where it's like, oh, we don't need to model the data. We're going to do schema unread. And um, I did a talk a couple of years ago after I went to Snowflake and learned the JSON stuff. It's like schema unread. Read my lips. The word schema is in there. What does uh -huh. schema mean? It's a model. <laughs> Even with big data, you've got to have a model. Even if it's a semantic model, an object-oriented model, it doesn't matter. You have to have a way to understand the data in human terms for people who are going to do analytics on it. The data scientists need a data dictionary. Well, what's a data dictionary? It's a model. It's part of the semantic model. Um, and so I've been involved with SQL DBM since they were a, they were a very early partner of Snowflake and had um, asked me for advice back in the very early days of how to work with Snowflake. And in my role as a evangelist at Snowflake, yeah, I'm all, all about that, about getting, getting uh, partners to get up to speed with Snowflake. I was always, you know, a lot of companies that I, I know I brought into Snowflake and said, hey, have you looked at Snowflake yet? Well, you need to. Because I guarantee you in five years, half of your customers are going to be on Snowflake and your tool needs to be able to support it. Yeah. But SQL DBM uh, being uh, cloud-based data modeling, and they're constantly, I've been very impressed with them. They're constantly adding new features. Um, and they've, uh, they've been very open to suggestions from their community. They have a very good community as well. And so, so that's how I got involved with them, Francesco. They actually... Uh, have Ed there has been communicating with me since very early on in my career at Snowflake. Mm -hmm. What happened there? Why did data modeling and data architecture seem to go to the wayside? I don't know how many models we end up going in and cleaning up because. Oh, I, 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 I wish I could tell you that it was something other than foolishness and short sightedness. Yeah. Um, part of it was agile. Agile software developers, as they moved into the data world, they mm -hmm. didn't have that experience of, mm -hmm. of a model. And I remember working early on in the Agile space and going to a company as an advisor and said, okay, show me your data model. Mm -hmm. And the DBA literally sat down, opened up, I think it was Irwin, and reverse engineered the database while I was sitting there. Mm -hmm. They had no documented data model. Right, right. right. It was, well, it's in the database. It's, it's in the database. It's like, well, how do you show this to somebody who doesn't know SQL, who doesn't have a login? How do you, how do you talk to a business customer about these things? And are you sure these are the right concepts? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, in the effort. And this happened with agile in general. P unfortunately, a lot of people got the idea in agile. There's no documentation, right. Is, but the agile manifesto says, we prefer working software over oh. extensive documentation. It doesn't right. say don't do any documentation. Right. And to me, a data model, and I've written multiple blog posts on this, is documentation of the system. Keeping the data model up to date, that's always been a challenge, but that's a, that's a process issue of it how is. you go about managing your databases and managing your models. Um, it, but as you start to talk more about CICD and data ops and all of that, you've got to have a model. And the model, if you can drive it, because I've always been into the generation thing since Oracle case, right? If mm -hmm. you can drive everything from the model, then you've got a way to review it with people mm -hmm. before it gets pushed into production. Yeah. And you, you've got version control on your models and all of that. Um, so again, it, it was just the NoSQL world was the latest round of saying, we don't need no stinking model. Mm -hmm. And Hadoop saying, we're just gonna throw all these files into a Hadoop cluster. Oh, and we've got the data lake, which as we all know, turned into the data swamp. Yep. And what was the, what's the problem with that, with the data swamp is, we don't know what's there. Mm -hmm. Well, how could we know what was there? Oh, I don't know, maybe you have a data model. Yeah, right. Right? <laughs> have a catalog. Hey, we got a question here from Steven. Uh, do you have any thoughts? ideas, feelings towards uh, what Gartner coined as the digital integration hubs? Mm, I, that's a, that's I, not a that, one on not, me. I didn't hear that one. Not, 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 that, not that much. No. Um, it's, when I hear stuff like that, I start to get worried that we're talking about EII again. Mm. Right? Yeah. And, and virtualization in the, I'll say the hardware software concept of doing mm -hmm. everything's federated. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not too sure about that one, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, d d data mesh is a completely different topic along mm -hmm. those lines, which mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of value in that. Uh, I've worked with a number of Snowflake customers who are implementing data meshes with Data Vault on Snowflake. Mm -hmm. And um, the technology is there with Snowflake to actually do decentralization mm -hmm. and bring it all together via the data marketplace and private data exchanges. So I see that now as a viable solution for the data to just have one copy of the data and be able to share it and have people access it. So the integration hub one, uh, I'm not sure where Gartner's going with on that one. Maybe that's where they're kind of going and maybe that's their, their answer to data mesh, which mm -hmm. they didn't invent. <laughs> I'm going to have to do a little research on that one. I haven't heard it before. So talk to us a little bit more about your books. That Outside of the foodie book, you got another one coming up, don't you? Oh, it says I'm working on a, a, a second edition of what the, the title is Supercharger Data Warehouse, which is the original technical book on Data Vault okay. that uh, I did with Dan Lindstedt back in, I guess it was kind of the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. And we've all been so busy, and there's been all these innovations in Data Vault with Data Vault 2 um, that I started working on it last summer. I actually had the idea and I talked about it a couple of years ago, but Snowflake kept me so busy. Um, I took a sabbatical last summer, a sort of a pre-retirement sabbatical to see, try it on, see how it fit and uh, got, got a lot of it rewritten. And uh, Dan and, and Cindy have just been so incredibly busy with the Data Vault Alliance and the Data Vault world, which has just exploded. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're, we're back to, okay, how can we find a few minutes to go through and, uh, and finalize some of this stuff. So hopefully we'll get that out here in in a couple of months. But yeah, if you just you know keep an eye on on uh, my my social and my uh, my blog, there certainly mm -hmm. will be a, a huge announcement once it's available. I'm looking forward to snagging that and reading it, and then inviting you back and um, on our author <laughs> series. <laughs> I, I love Francesco saying, what the hell is a pre-retirement sabbatical? <laughs> and said, and yeah, Francesco, that, that was called an extended vacation. I took two months off because um, uh, honestly, I had, had kind of been intending to retire and Snowflake asked me not to. Mm -hmm. They said, how, how about you just take a couple months off? We realized, you know, you might be a little burned out with all the Zoom meetings for the last two years. So mm -hmm. I did. Uh, we had actually bought this, um, the beach house. So mm -hmm. I came down here sat here, looked out at that view and, and worked on the book for, nice. for a couple of months. And then they went back, went back to work, worked for a couple of more months. And then um, my family and I decided, yeah, it, it really is time for me to, to take a little bit of a step back. It's, it's yeah. been an incredibly busy uh, 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, so time, that's, time that's to take a little bit of a break. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so not a complete break. You keep, I'm sorry, you, you, you're still keeping your blog uh, active too, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not publishing a lot on there, but uh, every once in a while, some things will, will, will pop in there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm try, trying not to be on a regular schedule. When, when I started the blog, which was 2010, and I was at my wife's encouragement uh, as I was an independent consultant at the time, she's like, yeah, you, you need to have a blog. And mm -hmm. so it actually started out as the Oracle Data Warrior. Um, and I posted a lot of stuff about Oracle Designer and data modeling and BI and things like that at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then at one point uh, in talking with Claudia, at that point I was part of BBBT, and she said, you know, really, you, sh you should drop the Oracle thing. Just drop Oracle, just be the data warrior, because a lot of what you write are about, you know, principles and data modeling. It, it doesn't matter what the technology is. These are approaches to building good systems. It's good architectural principles. And so I did take her advice and this was long before Snowflake. Um, and ended up then getting some gigs helping with SQL Server data warehouses as well as, as Oracle data warehouses. And then it just worked out really well. When I went to Snowflake, I didn't have to change the name of my blog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was kind of, kind, of, kind of a little foreshadowing there, you know, uh, uh, great advice from Claudia. Um, yeah. to be yeah. a little more technology independent and that, you know, opened my mind up to looking at other possibilities. Yeah, drive the principles and techniques. And, and proper adoption of those principles and techniques allows, enables more portability 
especially which is going to be especially important now. People are moving or their their data management systems around, right? Oh yeah, and, and that's one of the uh, one of the benefits I saw with SQL DBM and you know, all the data modeling, good data modeling tools. You reverse engineer the model that you probably didn't have <laughs> off of your current system into SQL mm -hmm. DBM, change the target type to Snowflake, and generate all the DDL out with the right data types. There you I go. mean, way, way, way simpler than trying to manually migrate everything. You know, people were writing extract scripts from data dictionaries to recreate DDL. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's so much headache and so much, you know, it, the flaws there are, are, are huge. Right. The potential flaws of missing something or misunderstanding the data dictionary or not getting everything out, way easier to reverse engineer it. And funny thing, back, back in the day with Oracle case and Oracle designer, mm -hmm. I gave tons of talks on reverse engineering because over 50% of the customers that I worked with didn't have a documented data model. Mm -hmm. And so my first job almost every place, just like you, Mike, was had to reverse engineer what was in the database because it always turned out it wasn't what they thought it was. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the problem. You know, something that we're, we're, I keep noodling on is how do I get to the point where I can encapsulate the content uh, of the data asset and easily port it to the best technology? Because the best technology is going to keep going, leapfrogging keep over itself. <clears throat> and you, what you described there, first, of course, do data modeling, but leveraging something like SQL DBM might be an enabler there. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... It's, uh, it's a great way to accelerate the migration. Right? Yeah. And I got a feeling the, the industry is going to see a lot of migrations over the next decade. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the number, if you look at, you know, Snowflake, we've got we've over, over 6,000 customers now. And the majority of them, I would say, are migrations. You know, there was some early on that were net new people who had never had data warehouses, never had an analytics platform, uh, maybe had been on Hadoop. So even that was a migration from Hadoop to Snowflake and moving mm -hmm. JSON into the variant Snowflake. So there was there was some early on that had never really done it at all. Mm -hmm. But um, the majority, I think, start from, you know, it's a modernization effort. It's like, okay, we need to get off, off get off of on-prem, get to the cloud. And then from there, the new use cases, the mm -hmm. possibilities just explode of what you mm -hmm. could do where you couldn't because you were hemmed in by the hardware of your existing system. And mm -hmm. now the limits are gone. Now it's um, just a matter of having the time and the resources and prioritizing what the business needs. Yep. Uh, yep. And then having tools to manage that are, are very important. I agree. I totally agree. What an amazing chat. What an amazing journey you've been on. How inspiring you have been to millions. Can I say millions of people? At least hundreds of thousands of people. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's prob probably, that's probably true over, over 40 years, somewhere in there. You left a lot of good foot fingerprints. Wow. Right. That's great. I know. And I, lo I love that it, the, the inspiration continues and you're like, uh, you're a good example, Kent, of a whole person. Like you really nailed your business life and you got your family life is going strong. You're involved in your community. Like this is what we need to see more of. I mean, one of the guys early on had said something about you, you should probably do musical, take up a musical instrument too, right. Kent. And I actually played the violin all the way through high school and I still have my violin and can still play scales on it. Mm -hmm. I also, uh, Sing though not, not as much anymore. I was a part of a, uh, I'll say a contemporary Christian nice. group at, at our church uh, for the yep. last fifteen years. Um, so yeah, I've tried to keep everything. And Taekwondo was the thing that really taught me about keeping things in balance. Mm -hmm. And it actually gave me when I started teaching Taekwondo, it gave me the excuse to leave the office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like sorry, gotta go. I got to teach a class at six o'clock. Right. So right. I'm out of here. And so that helped me keep that as you know, work life balance. But in that case, it was kind of work, 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 hobby mm -hmm. balance. I'm not quite sure yep. what that was because to, to my family, that was, that was work, right? That I was off teaching martial arts somewhere as well. Mm -hmm. And I still do that today. I don't run my own. I have a, a group still there in Denver, uh, Rocky Mountain Taekwondo, and they mm -hmm. teach out of um, uh, Club USA 
in, uh, in Littleton. And mm -hmm. one of my senior students who's been with me for 40 years um, still runs the school there. So I come up every once in a while and do seminars. But down here in, in Texas, I actually help out at our local YMCA. That's, uh, I got introduced great to that organization to help when, when, I, when I moved here. And that's uh, not my organization. It's not even my class, but uh, I'm, I'm friends with the instructor. So I've been going for almost 15 years there and helping him teach the class there and helping actually trained him as well and train some of his black belts. So I keep, keep that going as, as well and do that a couple of times a week. Uh, way less commitment to only have to show up for an hour of class every once in a while. Right. So uh, uh, <laughs> that's great. It was yeah. like, keeps, keeps my foot in the game. That's mm -hmm. good. And it keeps you active too. And like, that's something that all of us that work in, you know, in this, in this industry, we can be married to our desks. And I oh, love gosh. that it got you out of the office and it got you moving. And I think it that's that's great. That's a great takeaway for really all of us. And I also love what you how you stressed about the network and the network being of the utmost importance um, to you know shaping your career. What you do today really does mm -hmm. affect the people that will help you uh, secure your next role tomorrow. So that's and great. building those communities. It's kind of like a friendship bread thing, you know. Yeah. Right. And that's what we're doing here. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, yeah, you when you've known people for forty years, yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's family now. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. cool. Thank you so much for your um, talk today, Kent. This was super inspirational, and it was just Absolutely. so cool to hear your story. And you're so relaxed, just sitting there at your beach house. This is like this mm -hmm. is the the end to end of how we can we can really uh, grow our careers in this industry. Um, so for of course anybody who wants to follow along with what is coming next for Kent, you can find him at kentgraziano.com for his blog that he's mentioned, and then also um, on Twitter or LinkedIn. And of course, you can always find us at greatdataminds.com and see what we've got coming next. And hopefully it'll be uh, Kent to talk us through his next book or to share the photos of all the wonderful places that he's been and eaten. <laughs> it has been a genuine honor, Kent, mm -hmm. to spend this hour with you, sir. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And Glad we were able to do it. And thanks for everybody who uh, joined in, all my, my old friends yeah. here. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Cool. Everybody have, have a, a great day, one. great evening. Bye, everybody.